Hey there, BookTube. Noah, thank you for joining along with me again on uh, Ulysses 2020. We're going through Ulysses by James Joyce. This is uh, a, 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 a pretty awesome work. I'm using the annotated Ulysses to go along and, and get my bearings a little bit. But uh, it's, it's just a good text. So we're in chapter 7. This is Areolus. And I, I wanted to start start this one off just by saying that Areolus in in the Odyssey is is a short uh, section where Odysseus ends up landing on a um, island where the god of winds is at, and the god of winds Areolus um, does him a favor and bags up all the unfavorable winds. And gives him a bag full of all the unfavorable winds and says, here you go. Now uh, you'll be free to go, uh, to go straight, on to, to, to straight on home and get to your destination. And he, they do so. They push off and they uh, head, on, head on home. After sailing for a long, a long time, just straight on, uh, get, get within sight of their homeland and Odysseus is tired and he has a nap and while he's sleeping his men get to uh, you know talking with each other and saying well what's in this bag you know maybe uh, maybe uh, maybe Odysseus has has some some treasure that he's not willing to you know give give us our share and things like that and they open the bag up and when they do all the unfavorable winds come out and flow and push them straight back to the island where they started this episode. Uh, upon waking, Odysseus sees that they're back on the island and talks to the god of winds again, and, and, and Areolus is, is unwilling to help. Yeah, you're cursed, you know. Uh, <laughs> get, go, go, go on your way, you know. And, uh, and that's where we're, we're left, you know. Odysseus is, is, uh, is kind of... Back where he started. So in this chapter, in Ulysses, um, this this is a chapter that's set up uh, noticeably uh, different than other chapters. It's set up like um, a newspaper. You have headlines, and the headlines um, are just like like this, and then a little bit. And then another headline, and then a, a more of the narrative, and all through the chapter, and the the headline doesn't stop or start the activity at all. It, it just keeps on the the story keeps on flowing through these headlines, and the headlines might give some context or might give a little bit of insight as to uh, what what the the little part there uh, what you, what you need to get out of it. So it's it's pretty interesting. It's very it's a very interesting chapter. This chapter struck me as a, a sensory overload. A lot of sounds, a lot of um, onomatopoeia. So you have uh, Bloom going to work um, after the funeral. Bloom going to uh, the the uh, the press, the newspaper press, and there's offices everywhere, but then there's the big factory where they're printing the papers, and there's uh, delivery boys, you know, running around, grabbing grabbing stacks and running out to, to sell them, and things like that, and Bloom is, is there doing his work, he's an ad man, and he needs to put an ad in the paper for Keys, Alexander Keys is his name, and so, um, line... 142 House of Keys is the uh, the title uh, right there like that you see two crossed keys here a circle then here the same Alexander Keys tea wine and spirit merchant so on better not teach him his own business he's talking to uh, Nanetti who is the foreman uh, for the paper that is uh, you know, better better not tell him how to do his job. You know, uh, or or else he won't. You know, give him what he 
what he's what he's wanting, something like that, or he'll offend him. You know yourself, counselor, just what he wants. Then round the top and let it the house of keys. You see? Do you think that's a good idea? Um, the foreman moved his scratching hand to the lower ribs and scratched there quietly. The idea, Mr. Bloom said, is the house of keys, you know. Counselor, the Manx Parliament innuendo, innuendo of home rule. Um, and he just keeps on with his explanation. The foreman is very short. You know, we can do that. Have you the design? Bloom, at, you know, again, I, I can get it. It was in the Kilkenny paper. He has a house there, too. I'll just run out and ask him. Well, you can do that in just a little... And just a little par calling attention. You know, the usual. High-class licensed premises. Long-felt want, so on. The foreman thought for an instant. We can do that, he said. Let him give us a three months renewal. So, um, he's, he's saying uh, that he'll uh, augment the ad and, and add the... Um, the design, um, for a three-month renewal on the app. And and Bloom has a job to do. Bloom, Bloom now has to get in touch with Alexander Keyes and try to pin down an, a three-month commitment for the ad to run. And then, uh, and then it'll be done. And he, and he also has to get uh, that, that paper, get the design, a picture of the design for the, for the form in there. So, um, he's talking... Uh, he, 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 he busts out pretty quickly, and uh, only once more that soap, <laughs> line 221, is a, uh, another, another little <laughs> time when uh, Bloom shifts the soap <laughs> from one pocket to another, the lemon soap that he, that he bought in, uh, in chapter you know, 5, and uh, I, I love it, I just love this kind of stuff. It's so silly, you know, just this, uh, this guy that's, that's just, you know, <laughs> bloom in his pockets and his, and his stuff and, and, and nothing has its, its, its own place. He's, he's just constantly shifting it around and, and thinking about whatever. And when he thinks about the soap, um, what pops into his mind, of course, you know, the letter, Martha, Mar our, uh, Crawford's letter, Martha Crawford, what perfume does your wife, wife use? I could go home still, tram, something I forgot, just to see, before, dressing, no, here, no. You know, Bloom just, just, just sitting there thinking about maybe going home. Maybe going home before, uh, Boylan gets over there at the house to, uh, <laughs> to, to visit Sleepy Molly, you know. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that works out. Uh, Bloom definitely has, uh, has 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 some stuff to take care of though, so we you know continuing on. There's just so much conversation and so much rhetoric in this chapter. Um, it's just you know a bunch of guys around uh, going over uh, speeches, going over um, journalism, going over different different writing pieces that that have come up over the years, things like that. Um, the guys from from uh, Hades, from chapter six, are 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 here as well. They are you know contemporaries uh, of Bloom, work at the paper. Simon Dedalus, Stephen's dad. Um. Some others are are, are there with them. Uh, we got Professor McHugh, J uh, J O Malloy. He's one that has a whole lot to say, and. You know, they're just, they're just, you know, Bloom walks into their office, you know, little, little fanfare, and, and he walks in, and, and they're just having a time with this, uh, overly flowery speech that, uh, Doey Daw has given, and just, and just ripping him apart, you know. This is, uh, line three, uh, three thirteen. Ah, listen to this, for God's sake, Ned Lambert pleaded. Or again, if we but climb the serrated mountain peaks. Bombast, the, pluret, the pl professor broke in testily. Enough of that inflated windbag. Peaks, Ned Lambert went on, towering high on high to bathe our souls. 
bathe his lips, Mr. Dedalus said. Blessed and eternal God. Yes, is he taking anything for it? And they, and, and it goes on. They're just, they're just ripping into him as, uh, as they keep on, you know, uh, as, as one keeps reading, the others just keep, you know, ripping, ripping them apart. They're just having some fun with it, you know, just guys sitting around, you know, you know, pretty much being guys and, uh, you know, giving, giving, giving him crap. Yes. But also understanding that that kind of thing, you know, is, 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 is public speaking. The kind of the kind of thing that public speakers do to uh, rouse a crowd and to get them on their side and to just really be um, to really be uh, c commended as 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 a great speaker and what and what they're doing. So uh, you know it's it's a lot of fun to go through, but just speech after speech and different stuff and uh, Bloom Bloom goes in makes a call gets gets to uh to gets get some information on where Alexander Keys is so he can go and do his job and he busts out. He uh he leaves out pretty quick and uh you know bumps into a guy and there's this back and forth just this you know sorry oh uh, nah, 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 you know uh, just ridiculous. So um he leaves out and and who shows up you know uh within moments, it seems like, is, uh, Stephen, Stephen Dedalus. Stephen shows up and, um, has the, has the, uh, the article that his superior at work, uh, Deasy, had commissioned him to, to, to post in the paper. So he shows up there. Um, it turns out, you know, it, it, it does make sense that Deasy would, get Stephen to do this since his dad, uh, Simon Dedalus is, is a newspaper man, is there, um, what, what his role is for the paper, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure, um, exactly, but he's, he's there, that's his, that's his job, you know, his, his, uh, his daily, kind of what he does, so, um, you know, why not, <laughs> why not, why not, uh, get Stephen to, to go and do his, do his footwork for him, you know, and Stephen, of course, just does it, he has no, uh, he's just not, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't stand up for himself at all, you know, I just, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's wild to me to think of why, you know, why, why, uh, why Stephen is the way that he is, but there is a little bit, uh, uh, more given at the end of this chapter, so, Stephen walks in, and and they're talking in front of him, and he's just listening, and he's in, and he's and he loves hearing this uh, this high literary um, dialogue uh, go going back and forth. Uh, it's being read, but also uh, so uh, you know J J O'Malloy uh, addresses Stephen directly. Over and over, and Stephen just has not much to say. Let's let's look at line seven eighty one. A man of high morale. Professor McGinnis was speaking to me about you, J. J. O'Malloy said to Stephen. What do you really think of that hermetic crowd, the Opal Hush poets, A. E. the Master Mystic? That Blavatsky woman started it. She was a nice old bag of tricks. A.E. has been telling some Yankee interviewer that you came to him on the small hours of the morning to ask him about planes of consciousness. McGinnis thinks you may have been pulling A.E.'s leg. He's a man of the very highest morale, McGinnis. And what is Stephen? What is the reply? We're in Stephen's head. Speaking about me, what did he say? What did he say? What did he say about me? Don't ask. That's it. You know, and then they're off to, uh, you know, the guys are still just talking. And and so even when uh, there's there's been a, one time before when, when a, a question is directly asked of Stephen and he just doesn't give any reply, you know, just looks, looks at him shyly, I guess, you know, just, just come on, man. Uh, he has, uh, he has very little self-confidence and it's, uh, 
it's definitely something that I can't, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around. Just why? Now, um, J.J. O'Malloy, just before that, we're talking about a polished period, line uh, 766. J.J. O'Malloy resumed, molding his words. He said of it, that stony effigy in frozen music, horned and terrible from the human form divine, that eternal symbol of wisdom and prophecy, which, if aught that the imagination or the hand of the sculptor has wrought in marble or soul transfigured and soul transfiguring, deserves to live, deserves to live. His slim hand w with a wave graced echo and fall. Fine, Miles Crawford said at once. The, the, the divine afflatus, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. Do you like it? J.J. O'Malloy said to Stephen. Stephen, his blood wooed by grace of language and gesture, blushed. He took a cigarette from the case. J.J. O'Malloy offered his case to Miles Crawford. Linehan lit their cigarettes as before and took his trophy, saying, Much of us, thank of us. Now, did, did Stephen even give a nod that, that he liked it? Or... <laughs> Or, or what? And, and what, what, is, what is read there? You know, uh, what, what is said that is read in that, in that chapter is, is, is not, is, it, you know, it's, it's Joyce taking artistic liberty with a poem uh, by William Blake. So the poem is called The Divine, um, the Divine Image. And um, what it is saying is that, uh, that the, uh, the divine image is the human body. You know, the human body is the human form divine. The human form divine is a, is, is, is a, is a wonderful little, little piece. Um, this occurs twice in Blake's The Divine Image, Songs of Innocence. The third and fourth stanza, stanzas of the poem, For mercy has a human heart, Pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress, and every man of every clime that prays in his distress, prays to the human form divine, mercy, love, pity, peace. And what Blake puts forth in the human form divine is that um, when, 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 when a human being comes up against hardship, of any kind, no matter what faith that man has or that that human being has, whether it be you know a devout faith or whether they be just an atheist or an agnostic soul, um, when when they're in hardship, that they that they call out for the same thing that any other human being calls out for: mercy, love, pity, peace. One or more of those. That that's what the human soul longs for. And it doesn't matter um, what kind of faith you have. Because you have a human body that is the human form divine, the divine image is a human body. Because you are, are human, you desire that. So, um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful poem that is uh, being alluded to here. And, um, you know, Stephen, Stephen obviously uh, responds to the beauty of language. He's, he loves Blake. We already know uh, from, from Proteus that Stephen uh, knows Blake, uses Blake, you know, in his own mind, in his own thinking to frame his experience. And, and still, he doesn't respond to that, not verbally. He doesn't enter into conversation with with uh, with these guys at all. After that, you know, uh, they 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 make their uh, their plans. Some Stephen, uh, Stephen suggests it actually. He thinks to himself, um, "I have money," and he says, "Gentlemen, as the next motion on the agenda paper, may I suggest?" that the house do now adjourn. You take my breath away. Is not perchance a French compliment, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. 
Tis the hour, methinks, when the wine jug, metaphorically speaking, is most grateful in ye ancient hostelry. And, and it be hereby is resolutely resolved. All that are in favor say A, Lena Han announced. On the contrary, no. I declare it carried. To which particular boozing shed? My casting vote is Mooney's. So, you know, they're all, they're all, uh, you know, they're all putting on airs, you know, pretty much. It's, uh, it's, it's a very enjoyable chapter. Um, and they, and they, and they, and they get to go. They head out to, uh, go, go have their lunch, have, have some, have some, a couple of pints or whatever it may be. As they're leaving out, Bloom comes back, uh, from, from visiting Alexander Keys. He, um, runs up, you know, uh, we haven't been following Bloom, we've been following Stephen for a little while. But Bloom runs up, and uh, what do we have? You know, he walks up to Miles Crawford. Miles Crawford is the, uh, the editor, the, the man, the man in charge. And uh, so he runs up to him and says, you know, uh, Keyes, Keyes said that he'll commit for two, two more months, uh, not three, you know. Uh, his charge was to get a three-month commitment. But he gets a two-month commitment. He can't make somebody do something, right? Um, and and he, and he's doing his job. He's he's busy. He's doing his thing. And uh, the response is to, uh, "Will you tell him he can kiss my ass?" Miles Crawford says, throwing his arm out for emphasis. "Tell him that straight from the stable." <laughs> a bit nervy, looking for squalls, all off for a drink, arm in arm. You know, and Bloom is just watching him. Well, Mr. Bloom said, his eyes returning, if I can get the design, I suppose it's worth a short par. He'd give the ad, I think. I'll tell him. Tell him he can kiss my royal Irish ass, Miles Crawford cried loudly over his shoulder. Any time he likes. Tell him. <laughs> While Mr. Bloom stood weighing the point and about to smile, he strode on jerkily. So, I mean, they don't... They, Bloom gets zero respect, you know, and and that goes in line with the Odyssey at this point, you know, uh, but 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 it also just shows how how Bloom is, you know, these are these are Bloom's uh, Bloom's work associates, you know, and and they just they they give Bloom zero respect, you know, it's uh it's it's a tough life for Bloom, I guess, but uh, Bloom handles it in stride, that's for sure. Bloom is a is a great guy, a great character that just keeps going and doesn't let anything get him down. As far as I can see, I like it. I like him a lot. Um, Stephen, I can relate to. Stephen is very much in his mind, and you know, very much you know, uh, thinking and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, hermetically inclined. The hermetics I love, but the the lack of confidence, the lack of self. Um, knowledge that Stephen has is something that is, is definitely puts me off. Um, I don't know why, you know, he's, he's, uh, allowing his life to go the way that it's going, but I just want to slap him, you know what I mean? Tell him to, uh, you know, be as, be in, a, in a friend kind of way, you know, snap out of it, bud, you know, come on, nobody's sitting here, you know, gonna, gonna baby you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta try. You gotta go for it. You gotta make your mind up and go for something that you want. You know, these guys uh, in the in the newspaper they 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 offer Stephen a job. They know he's a writer. They know he can write. He's a teacher, and they offer him. I say, come on, come over to the journalism side of things, man. Write write something for us. Write something with some bite to it. You know, uh, Stephen doesn't doesn't even acknowledge it. Doesn't reply. Obviously, is not interested. But what is he interested in? Uh, I mean. I just, uh, that's my two cents. So I'm, I'm really enjoying it. We're off to, uh, to get to chapter eight. Um, shout out to, uh, my buddies that are going through the, uh, the Ulysses 2020, uh, Alan Big Hard Burks and Classics, Mark Nash at Mark Nash, um, Roz from Scally Dallying, Scally Dandling Around the Books. I love your channel. <laughs> um, Madeline, 
at made made with books um Cena um Sharon Goforth I, I believe she's kind of dropped out of uh, you know the reading uh we're getting up to March so some people are are getting overloaded all good we we're, we're going to keep at it and uh chap chapter 8 is right around the corner so thank you booktube for joining me um I hope you enjoyed this uh comment like and subscribe catch you on the next one bye